This week we've got Recovering Quality Improvement and Evidence-Based Practice. And um, Wayne Fukui and I uh, divided it up, and I'm, I'm going to use the first half of our webinar time to talk about quality improvement. I think everyone on this webinar knows me because I've been to the face-to-face -face sessions. I am a pediatrician. I see patients in clinic, and I also have the opportunity to work with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm giving this as background to let you know my orientation to quality improvement. At um, MDHHS and working with Children's Special Health Care Services, I've had the opportunity to participate in several HRSA-supported um, activities, some projects, and including some uh, workforce development projects, and have been able to participate in some quality improvement trainings uh, offered by HRSA. So this is what we're doing. What I'm giving you tonight is not just kind of my perspective, but this is uh, very much uh, a, a HRSA-driven curriculum. So learning objectives, and uh, these are on. On, on Blackboard, but just to go over them, what I want you hope, hopefully at the um, after the next 45, 50 minutes, you'll be able to describe quality improvement and why it's important. You'll be able to describe a model of improvement that involves a formal and systematic approach, not just kind of I want to get better and let's get better. And you'll be able to demonstrate how to apply that model to address a gap in services. So I'm going to try to give you everything you need to know about quality improvement in 45 minutes. We'll see what we can do here. So first of all, a couple of assumptions. One is when we talk about quality improvement, that's not to imply that we're not doing a good job. We're all doing a good job for children and families. We also, another assumption is that healthcare delivery is changing rapidly, and we want to do the very best we can for kids. So we need to make some changes to do better than we're doing now. And I think everyone on this webinar, everyone participating in my lend, is aware of gaps in care, disparities in care, and problems. And there's some of the things that quality improvement um, are, uh, can help us with. Quality improvement is really about process improvement. It's the science of process improvement. And a couple of things, here are some of the key principles of quality improvement. If you can't measure it, you cannot improve it. So things have to be measurable, and quality improvement is data-driven. Another point is, and this is particularly comes home to those of us um, in healthcare settings, clinicians, managed care means managing the processes of care, not managing the professionals. And sometimes we feel like we're being managed by somebody in the system, but we're really when we talk about process improvement and quality improvement and managing care, we need to focus on the processes. With the right data in the right format at the right time in the right hands is critical. Again, data is critical. And another, the last of these principles, engaging the smart cogs of healthcare, that is the frontline workers who understand and own the process of care, is critical for real quality improvement and to make it effective. It's not okay, it doesn't work if it's totally at the top and those that are actually doing the work aren't, aren't, don't participate in designing the improvement and implementing it. So here's some more fundamental uh, principles, and then we're going to get on to the fun stuff of how does it actually work. So one of the most important things is a why, answering the why question. Why do you need to improve? The other is having a feedback mechanism to tell you if the improvement is happening. That's where we come in on measurement. Developing an effective change that will result in improvement, and that's where it's really critical to have the frontline workers uh, coming up with ideas for the change. Test the change before attempting to implement broadly. So you can have a great idea and it is a flop. You want to test the change in a small environment and before you take it broadly. And then knowing when and how to make the change permanent and implement it in fully into processes and um, expand it beyond your small test. So let's think about the why. Why do we need to improve? And I've given an example here of something that I think all of us are aware of, something we need to improve. The average age of diagnosis of autism across the country and in Michigan is greater than four years of age. And yet signs were, in these children that are diagnosed at four, signs were present earlier. The parents often voiced concerns earlier. And we know that early intervention, the earlier the intervention, the better the outcomes. So 
this is a problem. Why are we diagnosing autism so late? What can we do to lower the age of diagnosis? Another issue we need to, we need to approve, African American, Latino, Asian, and children of other race, races were diagnosed with ASDs at older ages than white children. So there's a real disparity in the age of diagnosis. That needs to be that's something system-wide, nationwide, in Michigan, in communities, you can think about it. It might be in my practice, it might be in Lansing, or it might be across Michigan or across the country, something that needs to be improved upon. Another issue that's been found in terms of disparities, children from Appalachia were significantly delayed in obtaining a final diagnosis of hearing loss compared with children from non-Appalachian regions. This was a, a, based on a study done um, in, in, in that part of the country. So again, a disparity in, um, uh, in diagnosis. So here are some examples of things that we would want to improve. Again, granted, we're doing a good job, we're working hard, we're doing our best, but it's not good enough. So let's talk for a little bit, let's take the example, that first example about a timely diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental um, disability and see what we can do, what, how we might put this together. Now there are several things that we look at for in a quality improvement model. And the first is the goal, what are you trying to achieve? One of the things we might state as our trying to achieve is that we would want to identify every child who has a neurodevelopmental disability as early as possible. That seems like a reasonable, not maybe not easy to achieve goal, but a laudable goal. So it shouldn't matter where the family lives or what the ethnic or racial group they belong to or how much money they have or how much education the parents have. Every child who has a neurodevelopmental disability should be identified as early as possible and engage every child with a neurodevelopmental disability in appropriate and family-centered treatment as early as possible. Add the second one because identification is just the first step, isn't it? I mean, it's okay, so you've got them identified. You don't have, offer services and, or they don't engage in family-centered appropriate services. You really haven't um, achieved very much. So that's an overlying goal. Now let's take that goal to an aim. What are we trying to accomplish? To make an improvement, we need to be very clear about what we want to change. So it's nice to say we want every child to be, developed, to be identified as early as possible, no matter where they live, who their parents are, how much money they make, what their racial or ethnic background. Now we need to get down to something a little more specific. What are we actually trying to accomplish? And how will we know, if we make some changes, how will we know that a change is an improvement? Not all change results in improvement. We need to know if what we are doing is accomplishing our goals. So we need to be able to measure it. We need something measurable. And I really appreciate in this model that they acknowledge that not all change results in improvement. As a physician who's been asked to change many things over the last 10 years, it would drive me crazy when people would sigh and say, oh yes, I know change is hard. And I'd be trying to say, yeah, but what we're trying to change right here, we're going in the wrong direction. So we need to know what we what, have our aim and know if our change is an improvement. Measure where we're going. And then what changes can we make that will result in improvement? We need to be very specific about what we will do differently. It's not enough just to flap your arms and jump up and down and say, we need to do a better job, we need to do a better job. We need, you need to have very specific what is going to change, what processes you're going to change, and how you're going to do it. So this takes us, this is part of the, the what I'm giving you here is the background of something called a model of improvement. And I'm going to give you, there's a model of quality improvement 101 that NISHQU has, um, that's the, uh, national Children's uh, Quality, I'll come to the, what, the, what, what, all, what the acronym is, but a, a, a course that if you want to take and learn more about it in this model. But this Plan, Do, Study Act is, is integral to this model. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. We hear about it a lot now in healthcare, and certainly hear about it a lot um, at all national conferences um, that are that are related to to children's healthcare. At the Association of Maternal Child Health Programs conference, where I that I attended last week at HRSA related conferences, people talk about this PDSA cycle, Plan, Do, Study, Act. This is evidence based, and it puts the will to improve into action. It allows a practice, and here the practice is you're getting down into the cogs on the ground, the frontline workers. It allows a practice to improve while continuing to operate. 
You can't just turn off the assembly line and line it up again. You have families coming and going. You've got kids coming and going. You have services to provide. It's like changing the tire while riding the bike. And this PDSA model allows you to do that. It's based on small steps with frequent review of progress, just so you do a PDSA and another one and another one. So here's what PDSA stands for. Plan, you plan the test and you predict where it's going. You want to have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish based on your aim and what you think is going to happen. You do it and you look what happens. You study it. You look at your data and compare it with the predictions. You tweak it. You act on the learnings and to develop the next test. So let's talk about PDSA, using a PDSA in a primary care clinic. And this is not just theoretical. This is something that our practice at MSU did, uh, has done. And uh, this has been rolled out um, through, with support from the American Academy of Pediatrics or through trainers from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This um, has been rolled out to pediatric and family medicine practices across the state. Um, uh, accomplish the aim of early identification of neurodevelopmental disabilities, developmental delay, and autism in primary care. So you think about the aim is early identification, and one of the ways to go about that is to implement screening for developmental delays and autism spectrum disorders according to the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines. Developmental screening should be done with using a validated tool at 9, 18, and 30 months, or 24 months if you don't have a 30-month visit. And ASD should be screened with a validated tool, the MCHAT, um, at 18 and 24 months. Children should be referred. Children that are identified with the delay or a concern for ASD should be referred for further evaluation and intervention. And there should be follow-up to ensure that children are engaged in appropriate family-centered treatment. So that's the aim, to not only identify using the screening tools, but also to be sure that you refer and um, follow up on the referrals. Okay, so that's the aim, early identification. And that's what we want to get. Plan. The clinic team sits down and meets to learn about the guidelines. First, you need to know what you're trying to do and what the guidelines are and why it's important. Then the clinic team brainstorms about how to implement the screening and put it into the practice flow. Who's going to give out the screening tool? The screening tool is a questionnaire. When? Will it be mailed to people before they come in? Do you have the capacity to send it to people electronically? Will it be handed out when they check in the waiting room? Will the medical assistant give to the family as they settle into the exam room to wait for the, for the physician or the nurse practitioner? So who gives it out and when? And then who gathers the completed tool and scores it? Who enters the results into the health record? Who does the follow-up questions if needed? What if the family doesn't quite understand it? Or you, know, you look at the answer responses and they don't make sense. Who and how is a referral initiated? Who processes the referral? And then who follows up on the results of the referral to make sure the family got there and to see what, see what happened? So these are all questions that the clinic team brainstorms, works on together, comes up with a plan. And they come up with a plan, and then the process is tried. And let's say that this is a clinic, a group that has several different sites. So they try it at one site, kind of a little bit of a baby step forward. The screening tools, the questionnaires are copied, and they're hung in folders according to the age according to age at the front desk, so it's easy for the front desk person to have to pull it out. The front desk uh, staff has given a checklist that says which tool is to be given at which age, so they know what to do and they don't have to remember it all. The medical assistant who rooms the child, so it's given out, copied, hung, and forwards, they have a checklist. So it doesn't state here, but the front desk staff hands it out as the, as the family registered. Medical assistant who rooms the child gathers it, scores it, enters the results. The provider reviews the score, follows up with questions as needed, and interprets it back to the family. The provider is responsible for making an order for a referral. And then the clinic manager steps back and watches clinic flow. So that's the process. That's given a, it's given a trial at the clinic site. And then let's see what we do. We study it. After two weeks, charts are reviewed. So somebody has this assignment to pull 10 charts of nine-month-olds that have been seen in the last two weeks, and 10 charts of 24-month-olds who were seen in the last two weeks for well-child visits, and to look at each chart and see, was an ASQ given at nine months? Is it documented? 
that the 24 months was their MCHAT and an ASQ. And the results show that six out of 10 of the nine month visits had showed an ASQ was done and discussed, documented in the record. At the 24 month visit, only two out of 10 got an ASQ, but seven out of 10 got an MCHAT. Hmm. And then the provider is getting some subjective uh, information back. The providers are complaining of delays. The parents are still filling out those questionnaires when they enter the room and are ready to see the child and talk to the parents. So it needs to be kind of tweaked a bit. Something's not quite right. So are we ready to implement? At this point, no. At this point, the clinic team would sit down again and say, well, how can we fix this? What can we do? How can we make it easier for the families to get it done in time so that we're not delaying things? And what's happened here about why, why at 24 months they're not getting the ASQ? So they review them. Here's one, of the, one possible way of getting it done ahead of time is mailing it to the families prior to the visit. Have them completed at home. Questions are if their family doesn't bring it in, they get another one and, um, to fill it out in clinic. And the next cycle is launched. And then a few weeks later, there's measurement again. So then, this goes through four cycles. Let's say you go through four PDSA cycles. The practice team then decides they have a workable process. 10 out of 10 charts reviews showed age-appropriate screening has been completed and documented. The process is documented now in practice policy and implemented in two other practice sites. The PDSA cycle, including chart reviews, measurement continues in those new sites until consistent screening is documented. Then the practice takes a break from quality improvement. And then the next project will be to follow up on referrals. Not quite ready to do that because the referrals haven't gone out and haven't come back in. And people are kind of exhausted from this process right now. So just to review the PDSAA cycle, there was the plan, the do, the studying, and the acting. So you plan something, you do it, you gather your data, you tweak it, you try again, and you start again. So you may have seen, you may see this as you, you probably haven't noticed it in the past, but you will see this again. There are lots of graphics regarding this model of improvement. And um, one is, it's often going up towards the right, this PDSA cycle that you do one, and there's kind of cyclic moving up, moving up, moving up. Again, small tests, small tests, plan something, move a little bit, and this is the way that Huge changes can happen over time by these little tests all along the way. So back to the big picture, you're looking for earlier diagnosis of neurodevelopmental disabilities. So how do we spread the improvement so all children are screened and referred and get the care that they need when they need it? So it's great to have one clinic that sees maybe several thousand kids implement this, but how do we get it across the state? How do we get it across the country? There are learning collaboratives that focus on quality improvement. I'm personally, I'm, I'm participating in one now on improving services to children and youth with epilepsy. It's a HRSA, it's part of a HRSA um, sponsored, uh, it's a grant that Children's Special Health Care Services has. So they're learning collaboratives so where people can do that brainstorming, um, not only within their clinic team, but also with people from other clinic or other services. There are trainings by professional organizations. So HRSA has funded the American Academy of Pediatrics um, to train practices. And Michigan Medicaid has funded the American Academy of Pediatrics to train practices. Um, there's also one way to uh, give an incentive besides knowing that we need to do better. There can be reimbursement based on quality measures. And this is quite common in the healthcare world. And I, I'll be interested to hear from those of you from other disciplines whether there are um, incentives, financial reimbursement tied to um, quality measures. And one of the important things about the big picture, accomplishing the big picture of, say, earlier diagnosis of developmental disabilities is that the inflammation really does happen on the ground by frontline professionals. So I think it's really critical that all of our um, LEND trainees learn something about uh, quality improvement and learn how to do it because you're likely to have the opportunity both in leadership positions and then also as frontline uh, workers in the field. So let's now, we're going to spend the next oh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, planning a quality improvement practice a project for your discipline. So. Take a moment, we can be quiet for a minute, to think about what would you like to, what would you need to accomplish? 
how would you know that a change is an improvement? What would you measure? What, would you, what result will mean it's an improvement? And what changes can you make that will result in an improvement? So does anyone have any ideas? Hi. So um, one thing that comes up often in audiology is um, when infants are screened for hearing at birth, the infants that refer are often lost to follow up before they mm -hmm. um, before they are seen for further diagnostic testing. Um, so one of the things particularly that Matt Children's Hospital has done to try to remedy this is um, bring a parent on staff as a family-centered care coordinator. Um, and she gets involved in contacting these families, um, you know, discussing why this is important and kind of helping facilitate that process to get those parents in for diagnostic testing. Um, now, obviously that's not a cure-all, it's just one kind of step we've taken. Okay, so let's put that in the language of the model of improvement. That's a great example. So the aim would be to decrease the loss to follow-up or increase the number of children who have screened, um, I hate to call it failed the screen, but who need to be seen again. Increase the number of children who make it to follow-up, right? right? Correct, yep. So what would you be measuring? So we're measuring, um, I guess it could be percentage of patients that referred on their newborn hearing screening that are um, seen for diagnostic follow-up. Yeah. And then your strategy is to improve the in, in communication by having, to the parents, by having a family, uh, a, a parent who really understands communicate with them. Correct. Someone who's kind of walked in their shoes. Okay. So then you could set up a little PDSA cycle, maybe at one of the nurseries or one of the places, and have this go. Count how many make it to follow up, and then tweak it. You might find that you need to tweak the message. It's a great example. I think this is something that um, it's kind of multiple, kind of like your example of you're trying to fix the tire of your bike when you're riding it. Um, I think there are multiple actions that are trying to address the same problem that are going on concurrently. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of multiple of these PDSA cycles happening at the same time. There may be multiple happening at the same time and sometimes they're in parallel and sometimes they're in series. You do one and then you do the next and then you do the next. Yeah, and it, they don't have to be only one, only one tactic to make a change. Mm -hmm. Very good example. Does so anyone else have an example from another discipline? Um, I know in my field something we have a lot of trouble with um, when we work and consult in the homes is getting parents to um, comply with data collection. Um, so taking data on um, behaviors we're trying to increase as well as behaviors that we're trying to decrease. Um, so I know some systems we've tried to put in place are like daily check-ins through text or call, um, simplifying the data sheets. Um, a couple different things that we've tried. Okay, excellent. So the, the, the goal is, or the aim is to increase the, um, I guess compliance is a word, or the completion of the daily, um, of daily data, data, data sets. Is that right? Yep. So what would you measure? How would you know you were making a change? Um, the sheets would have to be completely filled out, um, and um, it would be hard. It's hard sometimes to check for accuracy, but even the first step usually is just having them filled out before, ahead of time. Yeah, I and mean, this is one of the things that you might start with. Let's just get them filled out, and then maybe our once we get that going, then maybe we can work on accuracy. You know, one thing at a time, because you can only do so much. So, so maybe after a, um, a few weeks, you might then look to you know count your data sets, look to see how many of the spreadsheets are filled, and then um, what what was the strategy? Um, there have been a couple, but one of them is um, doing daily check-ins um, with the family um, to say, oh, did you get to write down what happened today or mm -hmm. something like that as a reminder. Yeah, and then in that strategy, um, you may not know because of your role, who does the daily check-in? Um, myself or um, some of the other master's students that work 
alongside of me. So they get cheap labor to do it. Yes, correct. <laughs> yeah. So and, and the reason I, I kind of, the reason I brought that up is um, to see who does it because one of the ways that quality improvement can fail is if it doesn't become integrated into the system. Mm -hmm. So if it depends totally on an individual that you're interested. So Alyssa is really good at this, and then Alyssa goes on to, um, into her second year, moves to another site. Uh, whoever comes in may not think of it, may not know of it, and it might fall away. So part of the quality improvement then is to get it into policy and get it into uh, role descriptions. Does that make sense? Yes, definitely, and I can see that that happens. The, the sustainability piece is key, especially when we have um, university setting where people are turning over it constantly. Yes, yeah, and we have that in clinics where somebody's we, we an, an awful lot of quality improvement has um, been implemented by champions, and you know the champion is somebody who's really interested in it, and that's the way a lot of things get done. But if you don't take it from the champion and then integrate it into the processes and into the policies and into the job descriptions, when that champion moves on, things can um, can collapse or you know kind of go back to the way they were before. Definitely. Okay. Well, um, I wasn't sure people were going to come up with examples, so I came up with a couple of ideas. That we can, we don't need to build these out, but some ideas from the from the different from your disciplines. I really learned a lot at the um, last face to space meeting about usher usher syndrome. I didn't know anything about it, and it really struck me. And I was thinking one thing that one example of um, of an aim might be that every infant diagnosed with deafness will be seen by an ophthalmologist by a certain age. And that could be something that it sounds like that doesn't happen all the time, and that might be something that would be put into process. Um, or every child with autism will receive ABA treatment close to home, coordinated with their educational program. Now that's kind of that's a that's a, that's a couple of things in there all together. Um, might be have to tease it out to measure it. I was thinking of um, our two medical uh, trainees, Molly and Erica, with this next one, that every graduate from medical school will recognize the signs of autism in young children and know what to do if they have a concern. So there might be a quality improvement in terms of medical education. And that the aim would be that at graduation everybody would know that and you'd have a way of measuring it um, and a strategy of, of incorporating autism content into the curriculum. Any child referred for a diagnostic evaluation of possible autism will be seen within two months. Wouldn't that be nice? And then the measurement, how would we know what it would be? Here's some example of those that I had, I came up with. Eye exams for children with deafness, you can measure how many. ABA close to home and coordinated, more difficult to measure. You'd have to then decide what is close to home and what does, how do you know something is coordinated. But you can come up with some measures medical education and autism, timely diagnostic, you could come up with some measures. And then developing a change, what would you do? I'm not going to belabor the point because I think the examples from Alyssa and um, Shanae were excellent examples and we don't need to go over these uh, in any detail that uh, I came up with just to kind of give examples. So now I want to tie this back to our um, life considerations, you know, kind of the leadership um, interdisciplinary family-centered inequity. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, as um, faculty and trainees in this program, we all have the opportunity to be leaders at the policy level or as educators and pro frontline professionals. And we're all going to be working directly with children and families. So I think we have opportunities to participate in quality improvement and make the processes better, make the systems better. Interdisciplinary, improving processes requires interdisciplinary work. I can't think of I can't think of an instance in which it is, does not require interdisciplinary work. It really requires teamwork and working with people from other backgrounds. Family centers, the perspectives and values of families must drive whatever it is we're trying to do for improvement. It's not about us. It's not about making our lives easier. Now, making my work go more smoothly and easier might be the best way to have a process actually be effective 
and sustainable, but it's not about us as the professionals. It's the families and the families and what they need. And then the equity. We have a long way to go regarding equity. Um, and uh, we must improve our system so that every child uh, has the opportunities that they deserve. So to summarize, and then I um, summarize, and we're going to ha have time for more discussion um, before we hand this off to Dr. Uh, the model improvement is very simple, three questions to be answered. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? What changes can we make that will result in improvement? and that small steps with frequent review of data to adjust the process has been found to be the most effective way to make improvements. And then I just wanted to add, I, I actually um, wish I had run into this earlier. I learned about this course um, just last week when I was at the AMCHIP meeting, uh, which is Association of Maternal Child Health Programs. And NISHQ is the National Institute for Children's Healthcare Quality, and they offer a free online course on quality, on, on quality improvement. And I can click on it here. Um, this is something that we may, now knowing about it, um, may in future renditions, uh, I'm going to put that on hold there. Um, but this is something that if you're interested in this, you might want to click on this and complete this Quality Improvement 101. And because it is so clinically oriented and process oriented, the hours that you, the spent time you spend on this could be counted towards um, your, your, clinical, your clinical work. I have just learned of it last week. I have not had a chance to do the whole course, but the parts that I have done, it looks like a very nice course. And you can see the pretty pictures here of that PDSA cycle um, that relates back to um, uh, what I showed you before. So that's what I have to present. And I will now um, open it up for comments or questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not a question as much as a comment. Um, I just want to say that I. I really appreciated these ideas about quality improvement. I think that sometimes, you know, I, there can be a bias where quality improvement can sometimes, just in today's healthcare system, be equated with, you know, improved efficiency, which means, you know, we have to see X amount more patients every single day, which then sometimes can, like, lead to less time with the patient and less quality. Um, mm hmm like the worst outcomes particularly for patients so I know like in audiology we're expected to see a patient in 30 minutes so that's to talk with them get their case history do the testing counsel them and that's not a lot of time so this was really refreshing to hear about you know quality improvement that really leads to better patient outcomes rather than just you know churning out more patients very important point we sometimes um, we sometimes get sidetracked or pushed. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that happens with quality in my work is that when we talk about quality, there are um, more um, more boxes to click in our electronic medical record to prove that we, you know, to, it's, it, there's a huge focus on the documentation versus the actual doing. And I think we need to be focused on what is it that improves um, improves the outcomes. Other comments? Yeah, I just yeah. Have, a, have a question regarding the possible use of technology kind of improve outreach and making some of these data collection processes and uh, doing early screenings um, in technology um, apps or websites or anything of that nature. Very good point. Very good point. Because the strategies, we need to think beyond the way we've always done it, face to face, on paper, sitting in front of you. But are there other ways? Can we use apps? Can we send things? And actually, in the field of identifying um, uh, autism at an earlier age or developmental, dis um, developmental delays at an earlier age, there are technology is being used by many. Um, of, uh, offering the questionnaires to families in, in different places. So it's definitely that your strategy can be something very much, very technologically driven. You still want to see if it works. You know, you want to say, okay, what am I trying to accomplish here? And how am I going to know if I'm accomplishing it? And um, how will I know, you know, it's, and, and, and what am I going to do to get there? And then 
keep it going. Same questions, sometimes a little bit more difficult to, you might have a wider universe to be measuring, so it might be a little more challenging to measure it, you know, to, to identify your denominator. Yeah, hi Dr. Turner. I just had a comment. I really appreciated um, your ideas for quality improvement, and I thought it was very interesting, the, um, the idea of all medical student graduates should have the competencies in recognizing um, uh, signs of autism and other developmental disabilities, because I know um, right now there is no required competency um, for most medical schools upon graduation. Um, so that maybe Dr. Mendez would also know, you know, how exactly to work on that. I mean, right now with the Developmental Disabilities Institute, um, we have a partnership where we um, have families where we do home visits um, with children with developmental disabilities, but not all medical students go through that program. Um, but I mean, I think it's so important because no matter what field you go into, you know, you're going to encounter people with de developmental disabilities and you need to have some basis to, you know, understand how to interact and how to best help those patients. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think this is something that, um, this is a, a goal that several of us have for my lend, at least for the medical schools associated with our my lend, um universities, and that would be Wayne State, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan State, Western, and Central all have medical schools. Can we identify what are the competencies and um, work with the faculty there of where does it fit in the curriculum and how do we know they've got it? I think that that's, um, that's, that's something that um, that we want to work on, and then we could do it as you know as a quality improvement. To, you know, let's let's try it with one group and see what works, and then then and then broaden it when we've got a strategy that works. So I hope that you guys are getting some ideas as things are clicking, that your brains are sort of clicking away of things that you might be able to work on an improvement down down the road. Some of it right now, but some of it down the road as you get into your professional careers. Any other comments? This is Ann. I just wanted yeah. to say I, this is really a wonderful example of, of, of the quality improvement process. I really enjoyed it and I was just going to say to the trainees, if you haven't come up with an idea for your life project, maybe you could use this model for something, um, you know, in, in some of your experiences. So just, a, uh, just an idea. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane.